Now, let me remind you that the offering tonight, we're going to do it just like we did this morning. We'll have ushers at each of the doors with a, an offering uh, plate, and so you can put something in it as you leave. And I want to remind any of our folks that are watching over the Internet that the church still has to run, still has to go on. So you can always send your offering in, and the, the needs are still there. So let me just remind you of that. Turn to Psalm 27 tonight, Psalm 27. This morning's message was rather heavy. Tonight, not so much. I trust it'll be an encouragement to you uh, in these days. It's kind of silly to ignore the elephant in the room, and I'm not talking about anybody in particular, Brother John. I'm just... I'm just... <laughs> well, you know, I talk to people in the congregation time to time, and nothing's meant by that. We don't, we don't take offense here, but I mean, we've never been here before. We've never been where we're at. Uh, you know, it's one thing when we talk about the hard times and what if the hard times come. It's another thing when you're seeing it happen. And you don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. You don't know what new challenges that we're going to face. And they're very, very real. Now, our faith, of course, is what makes the difference. And I want to talk about true faith experience. I mentioned that uh, on Wednesdays, I've been preaching a bunch of messages from Psalms that I hadn't preached on in a long time. Well, Psalm 27 is one of those Psalms. And I'm going to use that tonight, even though it's not Wednesday, because it has some truths, I believe, that can help us a lot. Notice it says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidst, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me, put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help, leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I beg you tonight again for the filling of the Holy Spirit. I pray, Father, that your word would bring comfort, encouragement, strength, Lord, where we need strength. And Lord, we pray above all that you'd be glorified in our lives because of it. Do a work, we pray, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I didn't read the very opening description of the psalm where he said a psalm of David doesn't have some of the added information of other psalms that we've read. It's just simply a psalm of David. There are 77 psalms out of the 150 that we know were written by David. And so when we begin to read about his enemies and things like that, it doesn't tell us what time of his life. After all, in 40 years of being king, he faced a lot of battles. He had a lot of enemies. And many, many times, obviously, he simply had to look to the Lord Regardless, he'd been going through trials. As anybody in a leadership position like that, 
would be going through trials, he was having it. And his faith was being tested. Now, one of the things I doubt that David was surprised that he had trials. By this time in his life, he should have known that more trials were coming. The only last trial that you have is just the last one before you die. After that, no more trials. After that, that's when the ease comes. But sometimes we get to thinking, but hey, I have fought battles. I can remember going out to eat with uh, Dr. Lee Robertson. At that time, he had been in ministry for 55 years. I took him to Shoney's Restaurant, Manchester, Tennessee, and uh, we're sitting there eating, and he said, you know, Brother Allison, he said, this has been the most difficult year of my ministry. And I said to him, don't tell me that. I thought, surely after a while, it, it's got to get easier. It doesn't. And by the way, if you think in your life, well, hey, I am no longer, I'm retired now. I no longer have a job that I've got to be at and people I've got to answer to and this and that. Now, of course, you got to answer to the doctors and other things. But you say, the trial should be, oh, no, no. The last trial you have will be the one just before you die. You may not die because of the trial, but I got news for you. They're going to come. There are still battles to be fought. So here he is. God is still God, even when our world grows dark. An interesting verse in 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 12. He says, then spake Solomon. I'd almost like to preach on this verse, but, but uh, listen what it says. Then spake Solomon. The Lord said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. When things really seem dark to you as a child of God, he's still there. No matter how dark it seems, no matter how much the depression may have a hold of you or whatever it may be, he's still the God of the thick darkness. In Psalm 139, beginning in verse 7, David wrote that psalm and he said, Whither shall I go from thy spirit or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. And if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. For the darkness hideth not from thee. What a marvelous God we have. God's truth is still true in my trials. In the great trials of Job, he could still trust God. We shouldn't be living like a defeated people. Oh, yeah, this troubles are troubles. Battles have to be fought. And in battles, there are wounds that hurt. But we still trust him. We are to be a victory people. Because to be sure, we are more than conquerors. According to the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 8. Trials come, but let's not live defeated. Let's live victoriously. Somebody wrote, on the mountaintop, you proclaim your faith. In the valley, you demonstrate your faith. In the daylight, you enjoy your faith. In the darkness, you use your faith. Somebody else said, in the calm, the sailor's uniform looks nice. In the storm, the sailor in the uniform does the job. Interesting. Trials await us. And when this passes, guess what? There'll be more trials. David had been through trials. I want you to note first the psalmist's statement of faith in verses 1 through 3. He starts out by saying, the Lord is my light. The Lord is my light. Light. The Lord is my light. We're talking about Jehovah God, the God of the universe, the God of all creation is our God. And he's our light. That's a clear statement. You know, it's good just to make clear statements. I get alone in praising the Lord. Matter of fact, let me suggest this to you. Start going through the Psalms. And write down every time there's a statement like this, the Lord is my light. And then he says, the Lord is my salvation. So he's my light and my salvation. And say it 
out loud. You find yourself getting discouraged. You start going through the list that the psalmist could say about the Lord. And brother, it'll start making the light shine in your heart and the darkness won't seem quite so dark anymore. This is a statement of faith in spite of all the battles that he was going through. After all, who shall I fear? He goes on to say, notice here in the passage, whom shall I fear? If the Lord is my light and he is my salvation, then who or what shall I fear? He's promised never to leave me nor forsake me. Right, He's promised to be with me always, even unto the end of the earth. Right. What a great God, my Lord, my salvation, the eternal one, the almighty one. Amen. Wow. And then he says, the Lord is my strength or the strength of my life. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You know, one thing that there's a lot of fear going on today in there. People are very, very fearful. But what are we going to do if the economy collapses? Trust the Lord. Amen. You know, our instruction is still the same. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. God didn't say it wouldn't get tough. He said, but I've worked hard so I could have it easy later in life. Well, you know, a lot of people have done that. A lot of people never even got to later in life. Right. The fact that you got to later in life and you, your plans get changed. Well, I've had plans changed throughout my life. But what's not going to change is me going to heaven. Now, in this particular psalm, he goes on to say in this, after the Lord is my strength. He says, when the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war should rise against me. In this will I be confident. Now, we've got people here who've had to go through wars. I'm talking about the real shooting kind of wars, whether they were called to war or not. We've got people here who've had to live that. And guess what? As a nation, we may have to see that again. That could happen. Only the Lord knows what's coming up next. But the psalmist would say in Psalm 108 and verse 1, Oh God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise, even with my glory. I look at Daniel, who got taken from Israel, carried off into captivity with many of the Hebrews to Babylon. And the Bible says in Daniel 1, he purposed in his heart, he would not defile himself with the king's meat. And when Nebuchadnezzar tried to get the children of Israel to doubt, trying to uh, get the three Hebrew children to doubt God's protection, he said, your God's not able to save you. If you don't bow, we're throwing you into the furnace. He said, oh, king, we're not careful to answer thee. Our God is able to save us. But even if he doesn't, we're not bowing. Man, I like that's a statement of faith right there. I'm trusting God that this is the time for me to go out. And by the way, we all have a time. And we're going out as it is appointed unto man once to die. After this judgment, we all have a time for some. It'll be sooner for others. It may be much later, but we have that time. So we have the statement of faith. The Lord was his. He the Lord was his light. The Lord was his strength. The Lord is his salvation. All of that statement of faith. But now you've got to live it. The reality of your faith. You know, a lot of people can talk a good game. But then when the trials hit, they don't show it. Well, what about the reality of faith? Well, notice what he says in verse 5. He says, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. Now, doesn't that seem like a strange statement? He's going to hide me by setting me on a rock. How could that happen? I mean, on a rock, everybody can see you. But he's going to hide you by setting you on the rock. Well, it's not just any rock. The rock here is Christ. The Lord is our rock, too. So he says this. I go back to verse 4. I didn't skip it. It's my favorite verse in, in the psalm. He says, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that I will seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord 
and to inquire at his temple. You know, that's one of the reasons why I have a tough time canceling a service. I want to be in church. I want to be in the Lord's house. I want to be with God's people. It's why when we get a forecast of snow on Saturday night, I stay at church all night so I can be here for any who can show up. And if it's three of us, two of us, or myself, man, there's going to be a message. We're going to have preaching. And I'm not mad at the people who can't make it. People can't make it. They can't make it. But I just like being in the house of God. I like being in the house of God and praying. I like being in the house of God and reading my Bible. One thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Even in trouble, oh, especially in trouble, I want to dwell in the house of the Lord. So his desire was not to escape trouble, but to dwell in the house of the Lord. When the trouble comes, you can't be much safer than that to get closer to him, to know him better. Let me show you a couple of things. Turn over to the book of uh, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 24. Jesus warns people here in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what, is, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat? And the body than raiment, behold the fowls of the air. For they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven. Shall they not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But, and here's the key, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. I grew up at 105 West Main Street, Sturgis, Michigan. That was the address then. I think they've changed the address of the house since we've moved. Uh, it wasn't a very big house. Matter of fact, it was a very small two-story house. My brother and I slept in one room upstairs. My sister slept in another room. Now, you're thinking, but didn't you have another brother and sister? Yeah, but they weren't around yet. It was a rundown house. It's still a rundown house. We didn't have much. We had one car. One car. I know when I got to be 16 and had a license, Dad said I could drive the car whenever they weren't using it. I used my bicycle. Rode my bicycle to school. As a teenager, rode it a couple miles out to the high school. And yes, uphill both ways and in snow and everything else, I did all of that. I'm just simply saying, you know, we didn't have much. For breakfast, I often ate what we called coffee soup. Take a piece of bread, stick it on a plate, and put sugar on it, and then pour coffee over it. And that was breakfast. Coffee soup. Anybody else eat coffee soup? Hey, there we go, another Yankee. Yankee. Amen. The breakfast of champions right there. That was breakfast. I can remember mom coming home from, uh, from Kirsch Curtain Rod Factory where she worked on the assembly line there. And uh, she'd come home. She worked second shift quite often. And she would come home to fix herself a, uh, a fried egg sandwich and would fix us one too. And that was the meal. I, I tell you what has shocked me in getting older is how people eat because when we ate, we had one thing. We, di we didn't have chicken and corn and carrots. and We either had carrots or we had chicken. We didn't have three or four different things around the plate to eat. It was one thing. Uh, one of our favorites was macaroni and cheese. 
And I love the way my mom made macaroni and cheese. Now, we didn't have a lot, but you know, we didn't know we were poor. We had what we had, and we lived. We didn't have any computer games, any cell phones. How in the world did we do it? We had a field across the street, and man, you know, we won wars in that field. We played baseball in that field. We played football in that field. We did all kinds of stuff in that field, and it never cost a dime, and we didn't feel we were poor. Nobody ever told us. Today, man, people got to have everything. I'm, I'm amazed at the things that they want for toys for tots. Don't bring any used stuff in. Buy it all new. Why? I don't think you ought to give them broken stuff. That's cruel. If you're going to give for toys for tots, man, I, it doesn't have to be stuff that costs 300 bucks. That's insane. I'm getting off the subject. Just got kind of running at the mouth there. Anyway, back to this. I was reminiscing. You can tell you're getting old, but at least I remember where I was at. Amen. Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things, the things that you really need will be added unto you. He tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 6, having food and raiment, let us be there with what? He didn't even say toilet paper. I'm just saying now. Don't you, aren't you glad you live in the 2000s? And I don't need to carry on about that anymore. But that's the reality of faith. Because of who the Lord is, even in trouble, the desire is to just get closer to him. The problem is we get so much and God is now a nuisance. God's calling for me to go to church, and I just think one time a week ought to be enough. God is calling us to spend time serving him. God is calling us to give, and I've got plans for that money. That's why the movie, After I Got Saved, that I hated the most. Some of you may, now I, I wouldn't have understood that kind of hate about a movie, before I got saved, but it was Jimmy Stewart in Shenandoah. Now, if you loved it, don't come tell me that. But here's what I remember about Shenandoah, besides it being just a pointless movie, but that's, that's another matter. I hated it when they sat down to ask the blessing on the food. And Jimmy Stewart said, Lord, we want to thank you for this food, even though we planted it. We plowed the fields and we reaped it. Still, we want to thank you. And that's a sorry prayer. Amen. Who gave you the strength to plant it? I mean, good night. Like God would have been unjust if he hadn't given you as much as what he did. But to just realize that we have a God in heaven who will give us what we need may not be all the things that we want. And we're supposed to be content. Having so much has robbed us of our spirituality. Paul would say one thing about his, or Paul would say in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. Man, what a prayer. So when he asked God to heal him from that thorn in the flesh, he says, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. But he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul said, most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmity, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Yeah, we're too spoiled. We are just way too spoiled. God knows what he's doing. And those things that come into our life, he knows what we need, whether we think we need him or not. And in all the harsh things, we are still hidden in Christ. That's why he says in Colossians 3, set your affections on things above and not on things in the earth. For you're dead and your life is hid with Christ yes. in God. Amen. Man, what a marvelous promise. So here we are hidden upon a rock and that rock is Christ. Notice what he says in verse 6. 
of Psalm 27. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle, get this, sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Now, you know, I mentioned it several times, but honestly, it hurt me for eight months not to be able to sing in church. In the last two and a half weeks, I have enjoyed it immensely to be able to sing in church and not just stand to move my mouth, but to sing. Man, singing praise to God is a wonderful thing. Now, the dead praise not the Lord to sing. You say, but preacher, I sound so bad. So, sounds good to him. And if people around you don't like it, tell them to sing louder so they can't hear you. I tell you, I remember when we went to Mexico the first time and uh, down there to Brother Joins' place. And we, were, we met in that little church. They had about 40 Mexicans that showed up. And it was in January. It was cold up there in the mountains. It had to be probably around 40 degrees, and they didn't have heat in the building. And many of the Mexicans had to walk there. You know, some of the mothers with their little baby, all babies all bundled up. And they carried, we sat down. Some of you remember those hard boards is what we sat on. And when it came singing time, they stood up, and they literally raised the roof with their singing. They were just glad to be in the house of God. Just glad to have an opportunity to sing together with other believers about the greatness of our God. This is powerful. This guy, he's going to enjoy himself. He says, uh, <laughs> he says, I will offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. Guarantee he didn't look like he'd been dipped in dill pickle juice. You see, this is the reality of faith. I will sing. I will sing praises. Whether there's a struggle going on or not. So we saw the statement of faith, the reality of his faith, and then the desire of his faith. Notice his desire, he makes some prayer requests. He says to the Lord, hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Now, I trust that that's a desire that every one of you had. You do want God to hear you when you pray. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I long for him to hear me. Now, I'd like for him to hear me all the time. Of course, he says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Well, that ought to trouble every believer. I want to be able to come before him and share my heart and share my joy and share my praise with him. And I want him to hear it. I want him to really hear my heart. You know, you can tell people your problems and they can say, I understand. They don't understand. They're not going through it. Now, they can empathize with you and they care for you. But the reality is, they don't, you say, what if they've been through the same thing? Let's, say, let's take an example. Let's say, for instance, you had a parent die. And, uh, and you're hurting. And so you want to talk to someone else whose parent died. Well, I got news for you. Your relationship with your parents is totally different than the relationship with their parent. Now, they can say, you know, hey, man, I feel for you. But the truth is, because your relationship with different was different, they don't know exactly how you feel. Also, your emotional makeup is different than their emotional makeup. I understand hurting at the loss of a parent. My mom died of cancer. My dad died of a massive heart attack. And my dad died lost. It's even worse. At least I get to see my mom again. But I don't get to see, well, I'll see my dad one more time. And that's when he's cast into the lake of fire for all eternity at the great white throne judgment. That'll be it. Man, that's heartbreaking. Some of you are facing the same thing. But the reality is this. He knows. And he cares. There's the song, Does Jesus Care? When I've said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me. Oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. He knows exactly what you're feeling. Man, that's the desire of faith. Lord, hear me. And he does. In verse 8, even in trouble, he says, When thou saidest, Seek ye my face, uh, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I 
seek. God says, seek me. He says, Lord, I sought you. Would to God we'd respond like that to what God says in his word. God says, do this. Okay, Lord, can't wait. Let's do it. That's the kind of heart we're supposed to have. It's the heart of David here. Lord, you say it. I'll do it. God said, seek me. Okay, Lord, I'm going to seek you. So the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Well, why don't we do that? Not just trust in the Lord, but trust in the Lord with all our heart. Man, that'd be a wonderful thing if we just simply obey him and things like that. In verse 9, he says, hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away of anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me. O God of my salvation. He wants, listen, David had had times in his life where because of his sin, his fellowship with the Lord had been broken. I mean, there are times like when he first went to live with the Philistines, when Saul was chasing him. There's probably six months to a year where we don't find him being very close to God. He is hanging around the wrong group. Then you got another year after his sin with Bathsheba and, of course, the murder of Uriah, where, again, David's out of fellowship with God. Here's David now, boy. He's saying, Lord, I want to be close to you. I long for you to hear me. Uh, Lord, please don't put me away in anger. Help me. Leave me not, neither forsake me. Oh, God of my salvation. Boy, to hunger and thirst after God like that. How's your hungering after the Lord? I think a lot of people, I don't know, they kind of enjoy wallowing in the mud of trouble. As a a matter of fact, do you ever ever get this this feeling from some people that they're not happy unless they're in the mud puddle? But the only one that I know that's supposed to like a mud puddle is a pig. Verse 10, when my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. That's a statement of assurance, of confidence. You know, even when the people that are closest to me decide to turn on me, he'll take me up. He's not going to forsake me. Verse 11, teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Lord, I'm, I'm subject to you. That's just... Such a heart of surrender and yieldedness that's totally based on his statement of faith in the Lord. That God is his light. That God is his salvation. That God is his strength. To make that kind of a prayer request. It's how, by the way, the disciples, when they are threatened with a beating in chapter 4 of the book of Acts, would go to God and they never said, Lord, keep us from being beaten. They said, grant unto thy servants that with all boldness we may speak thy word. They didn't say, Lord, please, don't let them do anything to us. They didn't say that. They said, Lord, give us boldness so we preach anyway. That's pretty strong stuff right there. That's good. And then deliverance from the enemies. He says in verse 12, deliver me not over the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. Now you say, how strong is a faith like that? It's one thing to have a statement of faith. It's another thing to see the reality of that faith lived out in desire as well as in decisions. And then the desire of faith to be heard by him, to walk closer to him, for him to go with you through trials and see you through. The strength of the faith is seen in verses 13 and 14. He said, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I've heard this many times at funerals. Preacher, I honestly don't know how lost people face this. You know, when you have a saved loved one that passes away and you're able to stand by the casket knowing that they're in heaven right then. And I've been to the funerals where the person in the casket was lost. And you wonder, how does a lost person face that? How do they have to lie to themselves? To be able to go through that. Now, I just accepted the truth of God's word. God wanted to save my dad more than I wanted my dad to be saved. And he would have saved him if my dad would have called on him. He would have done it. 
Jesus died so that my dad could be saved. He rose, rose from the dead so my dad could be justified. But my dad rejected the Christ, the one who loved him so much. Now, I love my dad, but that was his decision. You can't make people make that decision. Verse 14. Here's his conclusion. Here's the strength of his face. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen thine heart. Now, get it. Wait, I say, on the Lord. That's where the key is. All right, we're in a time of trouble. Wait on the Lord. This too shall come to pass. You wait on the Lord. Say, but it looks like almost disaster. Could be economic disaster. Could be political disaster. Could end up being some kind of military disaster. The whole world is shaky right now. All right, wait on the Lord. I mean, after all, you realize time's coming when the Antichrist is going to be over everything. We're going to be out of here. That's not going to change. We win. Amen. We're on the winning side. That's right. Wait on the Lord. You see, this stuff all has to take place. It's all right. As we preached on this morning about the pestilences and so on, Jesus said, all that's coming. So we said, you know, Jesus said it'd be like this. All right, let's just wait on the Lord. Let's see how he's going to do it this time. And it will work out all right. Turn over to Psalm 40. I got, the, not Psalm, I'm sorry, but Isaiah 40. As some of you know, I hesitate to read these verses, even though they're wonderful verses. Verses 30 and 31. Then we're going to go over to John chapter 11 and we'll close. Verses 30 and 31, he says, Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Now the world comes upon troubles like this. They don't wait upon the Lord. They go to the bars. I'm glad they're closing them down in Ohio and in Illinois and be glad when they do it here in, ten, in Alabama. Okay. But we don't wait on the bars or the beer or the whiskey or the dope or anything like that. We can just wait on the Lord. And he will renew our strength. So this last illustration over in John chapter 11. Lazarus was dead. Lazarus, Jesus' friend, was dead. Mary and Martha had sent a note asking for Jesus to come because Lazarus was sick. But Lazarus died. Jesus shows up four days after Lazarus died. Martha's troubled. She runs up to Jesus and she says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother had not died. So Jesus asked her a question. After making the statement in verse 23... Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Now what is she going to say? Her brother's dead. She's expecting him to live again in the resurrection, but she's not expecting him to live today. So he asked the question, Believest thou this? It's fantastic what he's just said. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. She believed right about Jesus. You go on down to verse 40. Actually, in verse 39, Jesus said, Take away the stone, Martha, the sister of him that was dead saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. She has no idea what's about to take place, does she? Hey, folks, we really, we stand before you tonight, we have no idea what's about to take place. We can see God do some wonderful things. Some things that may be tough to take at first. 
but we can trust him because he is our strength. He is our salvation. And we're just going to wait on the Lord. Faith says, Lord, I trust you no matter what the outcome is. I know you. I know where I'm going. That's enough for me. Let's pray. Father, I pray you'd take these things and comfort our hearts tonight. We don't have to read much news to get discouraged. So instead, we'll get in your word. We'll rest in you. And we'll find strength in you tonight. God, please comfort the troubled hearts tonight, I pray. And Lord, may our confidence in our God and our trust in you, Lord, may it be renewed to even a greater level as we do trust the one who is our salvation, who is our strength, who is our light in the midst of great darkness. And we'll thank you for what you do in our hearts tonight in Jesus' name. Let's stand to our feet.